The hybrid vehicle has emerged in the automotive world to be the ideal powertrain, mixing the convenience and high-speed power of internal combustion engines with the cleanliness and efficiency of electric motors. The reality, however, is more like this. A scale balancing pros and cons to match present demands. Hybrids are a compromise, bringing together two technologies to make the best of both worlds. But by bringing together these technologies, the drawbacks of each are brought along too. With batteries, there is the weight and cost of rare earth materials, combined with the pollution and inefficiency of internal combustion engines. Simply put, hybrid vehicles are a bridge between two technologies. It's letting an old technology be slowly phased out as a new technology comes in to replace it. Hybrid vehicles do have a future, but they will peak soon before becoming a minority in the automotive landscape. Hopefully by the end of this video you'll understand how the very thing that makes hybrid vehicles so good is also the reason they will die out. Hello people of the internet, I'm Nico, and in this video I want to explain how the hybrid vehicle came to be what it is today, and also what the future for internal combustion engine cars, hybrid electric vehicles, and standard electric vehicles looks like. This is the first hybrid car in the way we know it today. It was created over a hundred years ago by a man called Ferdinand. Ferdinand Porsche. As a mere 25 year old, Ferdinand Porsche built the first series hybrid car, which is now the basis of basically every single plug in hybrid vehicle on the road today. So that means I have exactly two years to figure out some kind of revolutionary technology or I'll be worse than Porsche. Why do all the brightest minds have to succeed so young? In the early 1900s, when Porsche was just a person and not a car company, cars were, weirdly, just as diverse as they are today. You had early generation internal combustion engine cars that had hand cranks and a clutch and a choke and unique controls for every car. You also had steam cars that were slowly dying out because they were even more impractical than early gasoline powered cars. But you also had electric cars that were specifically marketed to women because they were quiet and easy to operate but had very limited range. The earliest models also had non rechargeable batteries. It was a time for experimentation as the car industry was just starting to find its stride. And so Porsche's hybrid, just like the hybrid does today, blended together the benefits of two different technologies. The only real difference between Porsche's hybrid and modern hybrids is how it all worked. Rather than having the complex design of some hybrids today, where both the internal combustion engine and the electric motor can drive the wheels, Porsche's design used the internal combustion engine only as a power source to produce electricity. This is actually the design that the more advanced plug-in hybrids commonly use, albeit with a battery pack for pure electric driving. Had it made it into production, it might have drastically changed how cars operate today. But it didn't, and when Cadillac invented the starter motor, removing the danger of starting a car with a hand crank, along with Henry Ford's assembly line dropping costs to half that of available electric cars, gasoline power won the race, and electric drive was forgotten. To sum up in the word of one irate motorist, the first day of the odd even system was a disaster. Gas lines at many stations were a lot longer than normal. In 1973, tensions between Western nations and the Middle East saw gas prices soaring. If it is up to us only, I mean, if we're going to apply our internal requirements, then we will produce exactly what we can spend. Anything we will do beyond that will create a problem for Saudi Arabia, a financial problem. Gasoline was rationed, appointments had to be made to go get gas, and queues stretched seemingly forever. It was during this time that the small, affordable, practical, and fuel-efficient Japanese car companies, like Toyota, swooped in and took over the American car market. 
But another interesting development was the renewed interest in moving away from fossil fuel burning cars. That same year, General Motors unveiled the urban electric concept, that thing right there, which admittedly looks like a very dinky little half-hearted project, but at least there was some R&D on battery technology to make the thing. It's working, my friend. Beautiful. In overall performance, the LRV more than met its standards. Further fanfare for electric drive came from NASA's Lunar Rover and AMC trialing electric delivery Jeeps with the United States Postal Service. These developments came at a time where the EPA was founded and started cracking down on serious polluters, while Congress passed legislation authorizing the Department of Energy to support research and development on electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. But ultimately, this failed to cause any significant shift in the automotive industry, and we wouldn't see any notable changes until the 1990s. And today I am very proud, uh, on behalf of everyone here, to sign this uh, Clean Air Bill, Clean Air Act of 1990. This landmark legislation. The 90s brought with it some major changes. The Clean Air Act, which gave the EPA the ability to regulate air pollution on a federal level, passed with bipartisan support. General Motors brought out the EV1, the first modern electric car, which received much positive press. What at the time was the most aggressive corporate strategy Detroit had ever embarked upon to not only create but market a practical electric vehicle. The first modern hybrid vehicles also started making it onto the road. And while these were incredibly complex, having a gasoline engine and an electric motor both powering the wheels, the concept proved to be an instant success. Just not as big of a success as you might think. Over 30 years later, hybrid vehicles still only make up about 10% of new car sales. And while other manufacturers do offer some hybrids, Toyota is really the main driving force behind that number. Now, if you look at the overall share of electric and electrified vehicles in America, the other half of that market share is fully electric vehicles. This raises an important question. When will the transition from gasoline cars to hybrid cars to electric cars finally be complete? This is the entire history of the automotive industry, from Daimler's tricycle in 1886 to the present day and broken down purely by fuel source. In the earliest days, it was a mix of steam and gasoline power. Eventually, diesel made it onto the scene, and nowadays there's obviously hydrogen and electricity. Gasoline has been moving cars since the genesis of the industry and is still the main source of propulsion. But the question is, for how long? because even now it's trending downwards as hybrids and EVs gain traction. I mean, it was inevitable, wasn't it? At the latest, it would have happened when the oil ran out, but it was bound to happen before that. We are a society that progresses, well, most of the time anyway, and it was only a matter of time before we figured out some kind of objectively better method for moving people. And in many ways, electric is just objectively better. This graph shows the lifetime emissions of a 2023 V6 Toyota Camry, a hybrid Toyota Camry, and a Tesla Model 3. It's on the assumption of 15,000 miles a year, and electricity from my zip code in Tuscaloosa, which comes exclusively from coal power plants. In other words, this is the worst case scenario for the EV, and it's still miles better than the standard Camry. Now, you might say that the hybrid is quite close to the Tesla, and for that reason, there's not much incentive to go through the costly procedure of building out a brand new charging network across the country, and that we should instead just keep using gasoline and the gas stations available. That's fair, I guess, but that gap is at least half an inch, and half an inch is a lot. But more importantly, there are a few more factors at play here. For one thing, we also have to contend with China and their relentless push towards electrification. I go more into detail on this in my previous video, but the TLDR is that China has spent the last two or three decades actively pushing battery technology and electric cars for many reasons, 
But one of the effects of that is that once they set up shop in the US, American automakers will face serious challenges to stay in business, let alone compete. But the other factor is the fundamental problem that hybrid vehicles have. Bear with me on this, but hopefully my rationale will make sense. Imagine these three lines are the progress of internal combustion engine cars, hybrid electric cars, and battery electric cars. The internal combustion engine car has been improving a lot over the past 100 plus years with better manufacturing practices, turbocharging, some water injection, maybe even synthetic fuel in the future. But even so, there is a ceiling for their improvement. Burning fossil fuels just wastes a lot of energy, it produces a lot of pollutants, CO2 but also particulate matter, and it requires a lot of routine maintenance. The battery electric car removes a lot of those problems and then adds other benefits. Really quick acceleration, the ability to recoup energy while braking, and so on. Sure, EVs have their own problems, but it's improving, which means that at some point the electric car will be so advanced that it just won't make sense to deal with the drawbacks of an internal combustion engine car. Now, the whole reason the hybrid came about was to effectively minimize the drawbacks of the internal combustion engine cars. The fuel costs, the pollution, etc. And if the hybrid vehicle continues to improve, to continue to remove the drawbacks of the internal combustion engines, then at some point it has to minimize those drawbacks so much that the engine has to be removed, right? I mean, the only reason not everyone has bought an electric car is because of the drawbacks of electric vehicles. The high purchase price, the charging speeds, the lackluster infrastructure, the range. But by improving the hybrid vehicle, reducing the price of it, the charging, the limited range from the batteries, that will also improve the electric vehicle. The high purchase price is almost entirely because of the cost of the battery, and that, along with charging speeds and range, will be solved given time. Like any early stage technology, electric cars just aren't ready yet for all purposes. But seeing the breakneck pace at which things are improving, and promised technologies like solid state batteries, these three problems will be solved relatively quickly. The last drawback would then be the charging infrastructure, but that will solve itself as demand for EVs increases. And yes, of course, this transition will take time. Gas stations have had over a century to spread across the country, and to expect that EV charging will match that in the next five years is unrealistic. It just will not happen that fast. But the point I'm trying to make here is that EVs, the problems that come with EVs are actively being minimized. And the only reason that people chose to go with hybrids is because they didn't want to deal with the drawbacks that came with internal combustion engine cars, but they also didn't want to deal with the compromises that came with EVs. As the drawbacks of EVs get minimized or eliminated entirely, sure, it will improve the hybrids, but at a certain point, it just won't make sense to deal with the complex drivetrain and the emissions it does still produce when there is a cleaner, simpler option available. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more videos like this where I explain how the automotive industry affects our lives and vice versa, then hit the subscribe button. It's free and it helps me out more than you might think. If you really enjoyed this video and would like to support the channel and make sure these videos can happen in the future, I do have a Patreon page that I have linked down in the description where for like three bucks a month, you can watch these videos ad free plus a few other benefits. Until next time, people of the internet, peace out.